So our next uh, speaker is uh, Pat Kuhl. She is professor at the Department of Speech and Hearing at the University of Washington. And because one department is not enough, she also holds the appointments at the Department of Psychology, Otolaryngology, Neuroscience, Linguistics, Education, and maybe more to come. <laughs> she is a member of uh, the National Academy of Sciences uh, since 2010. Uh, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences since 98, and many, many more awards and memberships, which, of course, I will not mention here, sorry. Uh, Pat is uh, internationally recognized for her work on early language and brain development. Um, last year, she gave a very interesting uh, TED talk titled The Linguistic uh, Genius of Babies. And uh, her work has been widely covered by the media uh, you can find her, you can see her work on the Discovery Television, PBS, NBC, CNN, CBS, and I will stop because probably I will have to mention all the TV channels. And today she will um, talk about using MEC to explore developmental change in speech processing, a focus on sensory motor connections. Pat? Thank you. Okay, so I, I want to thank uh, Charles and the McGovern Institute for the invitation. It's very, very exciting to have a conference on cognitive neuroscience that focuses on the contributions of MEG. Uh, today I'm going to talk about how MEG can uh, further the quest to understand human language. Language is one of the grand challenges in neuroscience, and I think that language may provide us one of the best windows into the operations of the human mind. About a decade ago, we decided that we would set as the goal uh, the use of MEG with babies. And I met Dr. Toshi Amada, an engineer at ATR in uh, Tokyo. And I remember being at a cocktail party and walked across the room and said to Dr. Amada, uh, I would like to do MEG with babies. And his eyes got very wide, and I said, is it possible? And he said, it will be very, very difficult. Now, if you understand Japanese, you know that means impossible. Uh, but I didn't know that at the time. And so I said, let's go. And so he, he joined us in 2001. And we are now uh, finding that the baby brain is, is discoverable. So what I want to do this morning is to take the first part of my talk to develop the rationale. Why would you tackle the baby brain uh, for early language development? I want to take behavioral data and event-related potentials, which we've been using for about 15 years, to motivate why you would jump into the field of MEG with babies, because it is very, very challenging. So uh, let me start with the uh, issues that are especially interesting in development and then portray that in the field of language and tell you what we've learned. So as you know, the many uh, uh, interesting uh, studies are being done on critical periods in development, uh, windows of opportunity when the environment has a, a very special impact on the brain. Uh, we're very interested in the kind of learning that takes place during that window, and of course, what puts the brakes on learning, plasticity, uh, before and after. And probably also, as you know, language is one of the quintessential cases of, of critical periods. Uh, this is a cartoon-type graph taken from a variety of studies that was published uh, in 1999 uh, by one of the pioneers working on, on critical periods. And as you see from this cartoon-type graph, uh, if you look at your age on the uh, horizontal axis and your um, skill level in an acquiring a second language, on the vertical axis, you'll see that the babies are geniuses up to about seven, but then there's a systematic decline in the child's ability to uh, acquire a second language. Within this period of time, uh, there are a couple of different um, critical periods, one for phonetic learning that we're going to focus on today, uh, one for word learning, and one for grammar uh, that cascade over that early period. What we're going to really focus in on today is a problem that I've been working on for about 30 years, and that is what is that window during which information from the environment comes into the baby brain and shapes the attentional system to one set of phonetic units as opposed to another, the ones that are going to be critical to distinguishing words in the baby's language. 
Now, theorists don't debate this curve very much, but what we're all working on is what's the mechanism uh, that accounts for this change in development. What is it that babies are putting to work in the early period that you and I can't seem to put to work uh, later in development? Uh, a critical reason for studying these early periods in development is one that we may discover the principles by which infants are learning and be able to apply those to later learners and increase plasticity in later learners such as ourselves. The other uh, motivation is that early developmental disabilities take hold during this early period, particularly with regard to language. So whether it's autism or dyslexia or fragile X or specific language impairment, it's the early period in which the ability to make those first steps, the gateways to language, have to be taken. So finding out what typical babies are doing may help us a great deal in diagnosing very, very early when the brain is still highly plastic what the, uh, the children who are at risk, and that would allow us to um, create interventions that are uh, novel. So let's start then by looking at what we know about this phonetic period. Uh, how is it that babies discover the consonants and vowels that are used to differentiate words, and when do they do that? An early study in the 70s, two of them, demonstrated something quite interesting about speech perception, and that is that if you create an acoustic continuum from a syllable like ba, to a syllable like pa, and equal steps differentiate the sounds in between, uh, adults were shown in the 50s to have exquisite sensitivity to change right here. Peter Imus in 1971 demonstrated that babies also have this incredible skill at detecting change right at the boundary that divides phonetic categories, and showed not only for the language they were being bathed in, the language they were listening to, but all languages, the sounds of all languages. In 1975, at Central Institute for the Deaf, we did studies on animals, chinchillas first and then monkeys, and illustrated that this sensitivity here at the boundary is evolutionarily deep. Uh, that skill, that sensitivity is enhanced in animals, other mammals who have auditory systems similar to our own. So that primitive basic cut, that sensitivity is there in both. Now I have to tell you that was an unpopular finding in 1975, uh, especially here. Um, Chomsky was very interested, and all people interested in language, uh, in the unique properties of humans in listening to language, and this property was shown to be not unique, not that it took anything away from the babies. The fact that babies come prepared, uh, innately prepared to hear the distinctions of speech were considered extremely important. And now it's been replicated many times, and everyone, including Chomsky, has accepted the evolutionary uh, influences on language. But we found out something later, uh, 1992, this is a complex slide, but basically what we demonstrated is that babies have an uncanny ability to learn simply by being exposed to language. And I'll tell you something about that kind of implicit learning. They're sensitive to the distributional properties of the sounds that they hear. And when you test infants in Sweden and the United States, uh, in Stockholm and Seattle with a range of sounds, what we showed is that the prototype stimulus, when it's used in a behavioral or a brain ERP task, uh, with infants who are uh, native speakers of the language that uses these sounds, they show extraordinary generalization around the prototype for their native language sounds, not for the foreign language sounds. And both groups of babies in Stockholm and in Seattle demonstrated this. When you test monkeys with that same set of stimuli, they show an equivalent generalization on a psychophysical basis. So they go a, a certain distance based on psychophysics from the prototype. So it's not inherent to this, this set of stimuli that you generalize in a certain way. It depends on experience. So this is something that babies are doing early in development and monkeys are not doing. So a raft of tasks have been used, and I'll point out two in the early uh, data. A head turn task, which is just a conditioned operant. Babies are listening to a sound coming from a loudspeaker. They're sitting on a parent's lap. A woman is distracting them with toys. There's a loudspeaker and a black box. What the babies have to learn is that as a sound is repeated, like ba, 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 they have to listen to a change. As soon as it changes, they have three seconds to turn their heads. The head turn produces what's exciting to a six-monther. The black box lights up. Something very interesting inside um, occurs. Uh, Event-related potentials have given us the same kind of, of uh, data using a similar kind of paradigm with a standard that's repeated, ba, 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 ba. Occasionally, 15% of the time, pa or another syllable comes up, and you see a signature of this phonetic discrimination discovered by Natanen. 
This is the uh, negativity that is um, coming 200 to 300 milliseconds, 250 in an adult, 250 to 300 in a baby. That deviant response is known as the mismatch negativity. Now, these two techniques, behavior and brain, have illustrated this kind of finding. There is a period over which babies make an enormous change based on the language they're listening to. And it happens between six, eight, and, and ten months, basically. If you test six to eight monthers uh, in Japan and in the United States with ra la, a, a syllable contrast very important to English, unimportant to Japanese, at six to eight months, the kids are equivalent and above chance, about 65% correct. And then a dramatic shift happens where the, the native listeners become much better, and those listening to a contrast that's not important to their native language decline. So on one side of the line, we like to say that babies are citizens of the world. They can discriminate all the contrasts used in all languages because we had, at the, in the early days, we had behavioral laboratories set up in eight countries with this head turn task, later using event-related potentials. This is the general principle. Uh, everyone is the, able to discriminate, and later, two months later, there's a dramatic change. So we're very interested in what happens during that dramatic change and the difference between babies and adults. Babies are citizens of the world. Adults, you and I, are very devoted to our native languages. So we can dis discriminate those differences for the languages we've been exposed to during the early period, but not to others. Uh, so we're also wanting to point out that this change that occurs, this focus on what's native for you, and the uh, failure to discriminate over time, the one that is not uh, native to you, is a very good predictor of future language. So what we're arguing is that during this early phase, babies are, uh, the neural system is getting committed to the language or languages, the properties of the language the kid, kids are listening to. And if you look at seven and a half months, so that's quite early, take a measure of phonetic perception at seven and a half months, use a native sound and a non-native sound, Here's a baby at seven and a half months in the ERP cap. You can see that baby's response to the native, a whopping response, a very early responder, and now a failure, almost failure, to discriminate the non-native. If you use that measure to predict learning of words over the first 30 months of life and divide the kids uh, median split into the better responders and the poorer responders with regard to their ERPs, what you see is the growth of language in the, for the children who have focused on the native contrast is much, much better than the children who are in the lower end of the distribution and not focusing as well. And the opposite, which is what we predicted for the non-native. It's important that babies focus on the native contrast. It's what allows them to leap towards language. If you remain in phase one, it's still early, seven and a half months. If you're still in phase one, meaning you're still discriminating the non-native very, very well, that indicates a slower growth of language. You're better if you're in the lower half of the distribution. So this change that happens between uh, six months and 12 months is extremely important for development. So of course, what, what's happening? What, what is going on during that period? And there are two things to say. Uh, one is that there's a computational uh, phenomenon going on, and the second is there's a social phenomenon going on. The computational one is a discovery made in the 90s in my lab and others showing that babies are statistical learners. They're sensitive to the distributions of stimuli. And I'll illustrate that in a cartoon in a minute. First, I want you to listen to mother ease. So mother ease is the kind of milk of language for the baby brain. Babies will focus on it. They choose it if you give them a choice. I want you to listen to mother ease in English and in Japanese, and then we'll show you plots of what the distributional frequencies of R's and L's look like. So pretty and nice. Okay, so that's not your job interview voice, but babies absolutely love the signal. Uh, what the distributions look like are these. So these are idealized distributions, but English it contains lots of English R's and L's on this acoustic continuum. Japanese has a sound in between. Uh, with very unique characteristics. Very few, but some of the R's and L's occur. 
but this is the highlight. So babies are very sensitive to these statistical distributions. In simple experiments in the laboratory using very few stimuli, like eight syllables, you can change babies in two minutes from listening more like a Japanese baby or more like an English learning baby by changing the distributions. So kids are very, very sensitive to these changes. However, there's another factor that's going on, and that's completely social. What we're arguing is that the social brain, meaning the baby's interest and the social context, induces this kind of implicit learning, very especially in social settings. And here's how we discovered that. We had known from uh, studying babies in Taipei and Seattle that this same kind of change was taking place over the same period with Chinese sounds, where the American kids are getting worse and the Taiwanese kids are getting better. We decided to do an intervention, expose American English babies who had never heard Mandarin for the first time at nine months in 12 sessions to Mandarin. We wanted to know what it would be like. It was like having Mandarin relatives come visit and live in your house for six weeks, and over that period of time, they'd play on the floor with you for 12 sessions. So here's what those sessions look like. Okay, so what did we do to their little brains? Uh, we had to run a control group uh, because this was very exciting for babies, and we thought that maybe uh, just coming into the laboratory and having this special experience with language would heighten their ability to discriminate sounds from all languages. So a control group, 32 babies, came in and just heard the American graduate students uh, playing on the floor with the same books and toys and dosage, but English as opposed to Mandarin. So the control group, thankfully, did not improve uh, their Mandarin skills after listening to 12 sessions of English. Uh, but the, those children exposed to Mandarin during this period of time absorbed it like a sponge. So their performance was statistically equivalent to the kids in Taiwan we had tested who had been listening for 10 and a half months. So the right experience at the right time makes a huge difference. We decided we needed to run this condition because the babies were so interested in the, you could see the eyes of the babies following the information. So we brought babies in with, and showed them on the same dosage, the same material, but beautiful DVDs uh, over those 12 sessions at the same period. And we also brought in a separate group uh, playing just the audio signal, and they watched a teddy bear on the screen. We believed that we might see learning, given just statistical uh, learning capacities of babies. We thought, you roll that information over the basilar membrane, and these kids are going to learn. What did we do to their little brains? Well, here's the data for audio-only learning. No learning whatsoever was uh, shown. Here's the video learning. No learning whatsoever was shown in those kids. This was a surprise because the kids were so focused on the videotape. They would crawl up to it. They would touch it. It looked as though they were learning, but nothing was going on up there. So it, we argued that babies need a social stimulus to do complex language. Language in its real form, in the real world, takes the social brain and all the mechanisms, either those many different experiments are going on to say what about the social is critical. But we were convinced that the social stimulus was playing a role. We ran a second experiment on Spanish. Uh, we looked at phonemes and word acquisition. We looked at the degree to which um, social behavior, like eye gaze following, predicted learning after the fact. Uh, and here are these sessions. Te dan besito. Besito. Porque te quiere, ¿no? Con la boca, te dan besito. Mmm, qué rico es el pan. Muchas gracias, Luca. Mía. Dos, tres. Hola, ¿cómo estás? ¿Estás bien, Spencer? ¿Te gusta el pan? That's a little bit of father ease you're hearing there. Okay, so you can see that these are very interactive sessions. And what this experiment sh showed, and I won't give you the data, phoneme perception is learned. Phoneme, uh, phonemes of Spanish are learned during these 12 sessions. Also the words, so 10 control words and 10 experimental words. You see the ERP signatures of word learning after these 12 sessions are done. Social behavior predicts the degree to which learning occurs in individual babies. So the eye gaze shifting that you saw during the 12 session as a predictive measure predicts both phoneme and word learning. But the big surprise came here. 
a month after the 12 uh, exposure, the 12 session exposure, we brought the babies back in and they listened to either a Spanish speaker or an English speaker in place at five minute play sessions counterbalanced for order. What we saw is babbling actually changed in response to the Spanish or English speaker. The prosody of Spanish was uh, produced by all subjects in the experiment differentially when exposed to a Spanish as opposed to an English speaker. Now you might think that the kids are such good imitators by that time, because vocal imitation is coming on board, that it was simply online uh, uh, you know, imitation. But we brought in a new group of babies who had never had the 12 sessions exposure to Spanish and gave them the same play, uh, play sessions, and those kids babble identically under the two conditions. So exposure to Spanish not only changes your perceptual system for phonemes and words, it changes the motor system in such a way that the planning signals must be there to allow babies to later on uh, mimic signals that represent Spanish. So it, I hope that's enough motivation to understand why we would try to head to MEG with babies. Uh, because there's something going on both between the linguistic system and the social system, uh, between the sensory system and the motor system that we'd like to get in and see. And you're not going to be able to do that as thoroughly with, um, with EEG. So we began uh, gathering a team about two years ago when our MAG was installed. Uh, we intend and are doing MRIs and DTIs and, MEG and uh, behavioral measures on every single child we see. We're focused on six-monthers, 12-monthers, and adults. We're trying to look at the entire language system, starting out with auditory uh, broca area and the arcuate that connects them, and understand the relationships between uh, behavioral skills, the structural and functional brain measures, and also we follow children every three months uh, with uh, language measures to see, how, um, to see how language is developing and what the early indicators are of rapid language acquisition. So again, the, you've heard about uh, magnetoencephalography and why it's the method of choice with babies. With our Finnish colleagues, we were the first in the world to put awake babies doing tasks in an MEG machine. Uh, this is a baby listening to uh, sounds from different languages through insert earphones. And you can see that the baby can move where, with the uh, Electa expertise, uh, with SSS and other head positioning. I'll show you a little bit about that in a second. Uh, head positioning measures, uh, the baby is free to move. Now, not all of these epics would be perfect for uh, measurement, but the point is we, we want babies to be able to move. We want them to be able to interact. We want them to be able to, uh, to be able to do motor behaviors and to vocally imitate and still record what's happening in the brain. So it's our method of choice. So we've done a lot of work, uh, and I won't go into too much detail, but just to show, look, a baby MEG lab looks a little bit different uh, than an adult MEG lab. Uh, we make it cute, we make it fun. Uh, we've, this is Ray Ramirez learning how to cap a baby. So Ray is here. We have four members of the MEG team here. And uh, we've gotten very skilled with our uh, ERP data. Babies wear the cap because it's the one that's it got the coils, the head positioning coils uh, on it. And uh, we need those. But babies are very uh, accustomed to wearing these light nylon caps. And then we digitize uh, the locations of those uh, coils so that we can track uh, head movements during the sessions. Uh, then we position the babies. The, the infants are, uh, we have very many chairs, different chairs of different heights, and we're going to tuck the baby up into the helmet. That What you see there around the head is a soft foam, uh, you know, kind of a foam halo, we call it, that allows the baby to move without bumping into the hard plastic doer. So it, it takes a, a, a bunch of skills uh, to get to this, but, but we have applied everything we learned from behavior uh, to studying these babies, and that has helped uh, get Meg off the ground in Seattle. So I'm going to devote myself to a couple of questions here, and the first one is that I want to look at brain rhythms and the developmental transition in speech perception. So uh, you've heard a bit about brain rhythms and, and oscillations, and we're arguing based on our other data that you heard about that something very different is happening in the early period and in the adult period. In the very early period, babies are highly plastic and their cue to learning is the frequency with which the item is occurring. So babies are hooked on frequency, not so much on whether it's a native or non-native sound, they don't know the difference, they're glued to frequency. Um, 
and the 12 monther is changing in the direction that heads towards adulthood where you, you see highly neurally efficient processing of language and the focus for adults is the categories that they've learned. So our studies on MEG in adults published in 2005 and 2009 illustrated that if adults are listening to the native language versus a foreign language, very different processes or very different activation patterns are seen. For native language sounds, uh, activation is fast and focal in the uh, language areas. For listening to non-native sounds, when Japanese adults listen to English or we listen English uh, learning, knowing adults listen to Japanese, you see a slow response and a very active, a very large area over which uh, activation occurs. So in the early period, frequency is the dominant characteristic, the frequency of a stimulus. In the later period, it's what you know. It's your prior knowledge that affects how uh, listening. Uh, how, listen, how you attend to the signal. So our question was, can we index um, the dominating principle? Can we see this shift in the dominating principle for perception in infancy, which is frequency, changing to, in adulthood, category knowledge using MEG? So we applied uh, studies of brain rhythms, cortical oscillations, and you understand how they are reflecting broad mechanisms, not the uh, attributes of the physical stimulus. We were interested in theta power because studies in both adults and infants demonstrate that relative theta power goes up with cognitive demand, the workload um, uh, in, in cognition. So we argued that theta rhythms would index this developmental shift that we've been uh, studying. If we looked at it at six to eight months and then 10 to 12 months and then in adulthood and used uh, oddball tasks that relate native sounds and non-native sounds, we have two, these sounds have been used a lot in our experiments, native, these, this, and this experiment was done in Finland. So the native sounds are pata and the non-native sounds are chi chi, which I don't discriminate very well because I'm not a Mandarin speaker. And our argument was that raw frequency of theta would increase for frequent over infrequent stimuli in the babies, regardless of whether it was native or non-native. Babies are glued to frequency. Adults would be interested, their brains would react, theta would increase for non-native over native, regardless of frequency, because our previous data showed that cognitive effort went up when you're listening to non-native. So we were looking at just this lower brain rhythm, just the theta, which is in adults, uh, 4 to 8 and hertz, and in babies, 3.5 to, it, it has been cited differently, but 3.5 to uh, 8.5 or 7.5. We analyzed the data in a variety of ways for the babies, and the pattern that I'll show you does not change. Basically, what we demonstrated was two interesting interactions. Uh, if you looked at the left column where we're looking at the impact of raw frequency at three ages, the significant factor uh, for six-monthers is the frequency of the stimulus. So regardless of whether you're listening to native or non-native, it's the frequent stimulus that increases theta. Uh, that is not the case for 12-monthers or adults, no significant effects. If you look at the second, the right-hand column, category knowledge, equivalent responses to native and non-native across frequency for the six-monthers, it is increased for non-native in the 12-monthers with marginal significance, 0.056, but significant in the adults where non-native is higher than uh, native at 0.028. So we can see that theta rhythms index this change, and our argument is that cognitive effort uh, focuses attention and that this is an attentional shift that infants are making in the early period. They are learning to attend to the features of native language sounds and learning not to attend to the features of non-native signals that they can discriminate. So the second question we're interested in is, what's the role of Broca's area in the auditory processing of speech, and how does this change with development? There's a long history in speech and language research of the interaction between sensory processing and motor processing. We know that these two systems are intimately linked, and we know that babies, in order to imitate, must be able to take the sensory patterns that they're learning early in development and convert them into motor instructions so that they can imitate. Our studies suggest in the laboratory that as early as 20 weeks, babies exposed to ahs, ees, and oohs over a three-day period for five minutes each day can begin to imitate the kinds of signals that the acoustic properties of e or ah or ooh, depending on what they've been exposed to. 
our earliest study, we were the first to, to study in Finland babies in an MEG machine, uh, Amada et al., 2006. We looked at newborns at six-monthers and 12-monthers listening to speech or non-speech. And we illustrated that for speech only, you could see a coupling between superior temporal and inferior frontal activation using MCE. In the newborns, we didn't see this. No activation for any signals in inferior frontal in the newborns. But in the six-monthers, you can't see this too well, the six-monthers, you began to see the synchronized firing after the stimulus was over at about 800 uh, hertz after the start of the stimulus, and again in 12-monthers. So we argued that babies, as they begin to babble, as they begin to try to imitate, are working the machinery to link sensory motor, sensory patterns that they've learned to sensory motor patterns that they're attempting to imitate. So this, again, motivated more sophisticated studies. We had, we did not, in Finland, uh, we did not uh, use MRIs and uh, DTI measures of babies, so we, can't, we don't have the structural data to help us localize as firmly as we'd like to. So using a new paradigm in Seattle, we're doing a lot of studies now on six-monthers, 12-monthers, and adults, um, monolingual and bilingual. This is work in progress, but here's the double oddball paradigm. We have a standard sound that's common to Spanish and English. Spanish listeners hear it as ta. English listeners hear it as da. It's the exact same stimulus. So that's the standard sound repeated over and over. We have two deviants, a Spanish da unique to uh, Spanish and English ta unique to English. So we're looking at responses to the standard and then to the two deviants. Now what I'm going to show you next is a, a 4D movie rendered in uh, 2D uh, that combines for individual subjects that person's structural data, that person's DTI data showing the arcuate, this uh, structure that we've begun to look at, and MEG data plotted in 3D registration of, the, of, of that information. This took a lot of in-house work. We've got four people here who can explain all, this, all the steps, but I want to show you these movies. You'll first see an adult, and I'll walk you through it. Then you'll see the six-monther and the 12-monther, our bilingual adult, which is the fourth movie I had, was crashing this morning, so we can't see that one. And then I'll show you what we have statistically uh, so far in the in-progress study. So, okay, here's our adult uh, segmentation, parcellation by free surfer. Uh, I identify the four structures of interest here, two in the auditory area, Wernicke's area, the superior temporal, the middle temporal gyrus, the two uh, Broca area, opercularis and triangularis, and the arcuate for this, this is this individual's brain. What you'll see next is the rendering uh, from volumetric data uh, created by Ray Ramirez in MATLAB. Uh, you see the response to the standard stimulus. On the bottom, auditory and Broca's activity, uh, the current strength of the current um, is shown. And here's the English deviant comes, and you can see more activation in Broca's to the new sound, the deviant sound. And then the sound that is not contained in this adult's language, uh, the Spanish deviant. Now in 3D, with, on a 3D monitor with your black glasses on, this is very, very, very compelling. You feel like you can reach out and touch it. So I'm stopping the film just to see that the two deviants are promoting more um, response, especially early in Broca's um, in comparison to the standard, which is repeated over and over in the experiment. Okay, so uh, again, in this adult, um, you can see activity is greater in Broca's. Now let's look at the six-monther. Here's a single six-month-old baby. Again, free surfer, but it takes special rendering to produce these data in babies. Uh, the structural data, superior temporal gyrus, middle temporal, the opercularis and triangularis, and the arcuate. And the movie showing meg activation for the baby to the standard. More activity in general and more activity in comparison to the adult in the um, Broca area. Synchronized activity, a lot of it, um, for the English deviant sound. And then you see the Spanish deviant early reaction in Broca's to that signal. And then again, high levels of activity in both areas. And here we focus just a bit on a place where you can see the Broca area activity to the two deviants. 
Okay, now I want to show you the 12 monther. Segmented parcellated brain. There, we are studying all of these components, the structural MRI, uh, the very interesting arcuate, uh, individual differences in the arcuate can be seen. And we're, uh, you can see the great activity in Broca's uh, for the 12 monthers. So individual differences and uh, within a particular age and then over age, uh, very, very uh, important differences in the growth of the structural um, data, white matter, gray matter, and the arcuate, as well as the types of functional activation that we see. Okay. So uh, now let me show you what we have statistically. So there's not sufficient data to present statistics on the babies yet. We have about five or six babies per uh, condition. Uh, but we do have the adult uh, monolinguals and bilinguals at an N of 10. That's still not, we're not satisfied yet. But we can show you some MEG data. Here's the MMF, sensor level results, uh, 10 subjects in each condition. We're looking at nine pairs of sensors uh, near the superior temporal region. And uh, at, at the peak between uh, 100 and 250. So uh, expectedly, you're seeing a left hemisphere effect uh, difference between the MMF. This is the subtraction between the deviant and standard for English and Spanish in the left, but uh, patterned similarly, but not significant in the right in monolinguals. In bilinguals, uh, we were surprised. We'll see if this holds up. Uh, more reaction in the right hemisphere, but non-significant differences between the um, Spanish and the English um, MMFs, which is what you'd expect in bilinguals. Now, if we look at MACE results, MCE, uh, left superior temporal region, uh, we see uh, no differences in the bilinguals, significant differences in the monolinguals, and a difference particularly in the uh, response to the Spanish deviant, which is, again, as you'd predict, in left superior temporal. Again, suggesting that um, there is activity in the, um, in the left superior temporal region that's related to the processing of these sounds, both in, we can see it in the baby data, but we don't have statistical um, data to, to give it to you yet. And left inferior frontal region, um, again, we see uh, not a difference in the monolinguals and significant differences between uh, the reaction to the Spanish deviant. This is not the MMF. This is just responding to the deviant sound. And we see more uh, reaction in left inferior frontal to the uh, Spanish deviant in uh, bilinguals than in monolinguals. So let me just, we are interested in trying to understand uh, what Broca's area is contributing to speech analysis during this learning period. And so far, I would say the analyses look as though the Broca's area is contributing a kind of analysis by synthesis uh, approach to the signal. It's involved, uh, especially in early in development, more activity in the motor areas. And in adults, it's more active for the novel stimulus. So these are the patterns, but this is preliminary. And we have to have about 12 to 15 subjects in each of the monolingual and bilingual groups at each age before we can be totally confident. So just as uh, Rita Hari mentioned, we're interested in uh, F2F, or face-to-face -face neuroscience, uh, particularly because we're convinced the social brain makes a huge difference in learning early in development. We're interested in how linguistic areas and uh, social areas interact. And then, of course, the sensory motor connections are of, of primary interest to us. Uh, we're starting here, because this is where we think it all <coughs> begins, with babies and uh, their parents interacting. We don't have two MEG machines uh, to, in Seattle, though that would be nice. Uh, so at the moment, we're taking the um, ERP uh, cap and putting it on the mother and co-registering information with the, EE, uh, with the um, MEG data from the baby as the two of them interact. 
and we're interested in the presence or absence of that social stimulus for the baby, what happens when the mother leaves as opposed to being there. And we're very interested in the kinds of vocal uh, behavior and play uh, that uh, go on between uh, adult and infant. Now, in the last minutes, I'm going to show you a little bit about where we're also headed with um, MEG. We're very interested in uh, autism, and we have tests that are quite sensitive to the difference between typically developing and uh, autistic children. This is a behavioral experiment that we have been running for some time with older, this is toddlers diagnosed with autism, and typical children in all of our studies show a great preponderance of interest in motheries, but children with autism do not. And these data show a behavioral response to the choice between motheries and a non-speech analog. Here's the motheries signal we're playing. Look at I So she says, look what I have. It's a pot. Here's the non-speech analog. We've extracted the formant frequencies, and we're playing them as pure tone analogs over time. Same amplitude characteristics. So that's a very odd signal. And, and typically developing children will listen to it once or twice, but not repeatedly. Children with autism greatly prefer this signal. And uh, we're now testing it. It can be run as early as 15 weeks in children this preference test, we're running it with six-monthers uh, who are the siblings of children who have autism. So the data expect about 30% of those siblings will later be diagnosed with autism. And we're trying to understand whether this could be a behavioral marker of that tendency. We have also used this measure, separating the kids who really, the autistic children who really prefer the non-speech versus those who have more equal preference for, for motherese and the non-speech signal, predict both phoneme uh, the brain responses to phonemes and brain responses to words. Uh, one of our uh, experiments that's now uh, submitted for publication uh, uses this change, the difference between the signature, neural signatures, this is ERP data. We have yet to put the children in MEG, but we're about to. Uh, the neural response to known words and unknown words. We know that in typically developing children, so these are various uh, electrode sites in typically developing and toddlers with ASD. These are two-year-olds. So in two-year-old typically developing, you see a highly focalized response at T3 separating known and unknown words. You do not see that in group data with children with ASD. However, the ASD kids vary greatly. If you take this measure, uh, this looking for responses at T3 to the known words um, with the children with autism and use that as a predictor, then two years later and four years later, the children who had better responses at T3 are the ones who show excellent. OK, so here is our, this is the kids who are better socially and poor socially. You can see that it separates them. But this is the interesting data. Uh, so we're plotting here uh, cognitive ability, adaptive behavior, and receptive language as a function of time one ERP. And we expect a negative correlation in that the more negative the response, the better um, the response to known words. And you can see that these correlations improve over time. So from two to the age of six, this particular uh, measure of known versus unknown words is a better predictor than they were taking many, many measures on these children, uh, 20 uh, measures or so. And beyond all measures, this is the greatest predictor of outcomes uh, linguistic, cognitive, and behavioral in children uh, with autism. So we're very excited to use MEG to see what the um, responses to words and phonemes look like in the siblings of children with autism. So uh, it takes an army to do all of this work, and I simply want to recognize not only the four people from Seattle who are doing MEG studies uh, and who are here today, but all of the other people who contribute to this work. Thanks very much. All right. Chinese or right. And in the, did you look to see, have you looked to see if that sustained? It does for a while.
So ERP measures of the phoneme perception in the uh, Mandarin and the Spanish experiments. So if you take babies at 14 months, so they were exposed between 10, 9 and 10 and a half months. Their tests are done at about 11 to 11 and a half months. They, we tell the parents not to expose them to Spanish or Mandarin after that. We test them at 14 months. Neural signatures are still there at 14 months. They're not there at 18 months. So we're now in the, which you'd expect. So there's a forgetting function. Now our hypothesis, but it's very hard to get the kids back, is that if you brought them back at three or five and exposed them to that new language and compared them to a control group who had not ever been exposed to the language, that the vestiges of learning would still be there. So, but we are plotting now neural forgetting. So we want to see that forgetting function and what that's related to with regard to how they looked right after the exposure. Yeah. Yes. In your old broadcast, why do you just choose C and G language? I mean, why did other parents? I just want to know some reason behind it. Oh, why those sounds were chosen? Because there's a, lot of co there's a lot of acoustic analysis done by my Taiwanese colleagues. So I had two students from Taiwan who had done measurements on the differences between affricates and fricatives in the two languages. And so they're very, we know tons about the acoustic differences and when they appear, when that change occurs in production and in perception. So that was the reason that we chose that sound pair. So it, it is commonly said that children that are raised bilingual tend to learn both languages later right. than monolingual. Yeah. Do you have an insight as to why the reason for that? Well, we have data now suggesting, I couldn't present it, not enough time, but we have data suggesting that the window of learning is extended in bilingual children. So when you test them with the same contrasts that you test monolingual children are, and look at their ERP signatures at the early period and the slightly later period, uh, all children move from a positive MMR, so this mismatch response measured with ERPs is more positive. So they, you get a positive reactivity instead of negativity. With exposure, you get a more negative response, which turns into the adult-like MMN. So if you look at the same age, bilingual children are showing more positivity than negativity. And that negativity develops, but it seems like it takes a little bit longer. Our hypothesis is that if you're doing statistical learning on two tracks of data, you've got Spanish coming in and English coming in, or two languages, you need to keep those statistical distributions separate. And perhaps social stimuli, like the people who are using those languages, help you keep those distributions separate. And motheries, fatheries, it stretches the distributions. All that helps. But under those conditions, if you're developing a mathematical model of language, which is our hypothesis, you're really driving the closure of the critical period by variability. That variability is greater. Therefore, adaptively, you should stay open longer. Now, we have a critical test underway right now where we test both monolinguals and bilinguals with a third contrast that's not native to either one. And we're saying that the monolingual kids will have shut that one down already. And the bilingual kids may stay more relatively open to that contrast. And when, so we're, the, the plot you have to look at eventually is how long, if we're right, that they're staying open longer, that you know, the critical period duration is driven not just by strictly time, but by experience. That's our argument. You're building a mental machine, a cognitive mental you know, structural machinery to handle one language and not all, um, that you ought to stay open longer in case other variability is soon to be introduced. And we don't know how long that might last if we're correct about that hypothesis. But we'll be able to test with the third contrast that is not, uh, not native to either of the two groups. So don't have the data yet. Oh. Oh, there, I was really intrigued by the individual differences you found in those videos you showed us with the 12-month-old and 6-month-old. Is that the difference, individual difference associated with either knowledge of the language or performance or... Yeah, so we're in the midst of a massive study where we've got behavioral data on the children, uh, DTI, uh, MRI, MEG, and follow-up. So uh, we, just are, we have just made tractable all these measurements to co-register them because we're finding that the visualizations are not just visualizations, but they drive our thinking, they drive our uh, brainstorming sessions with the group. And so we decided that we should first work to bring these three kinds of signals into a coherent signal that we could observe. 
and use that to drive not only this first look at auditory and broca, but to look at the other. You know, there's more than just the arcuate connecting. And we're interested in language and social, so we're just at the surface of, of a tsunami of data. And uh, I think the patterns we see in these individual subjects are interesting and worth showing. And the only thing we can say is activity is greater in the younger participants and that the uh, novel stimulus, uh, in babies the uh, Broca's area is more active and for the novel stimulus in adults it is more active. That seems to be a pattern but again statistics are statistics and we have to get all of the subjects and uh, analyze all the data before we can confidently express that view. Yeah, thank you. Uh, that cascade over that early period. What we're going to really focus in on today is a problem that I've been working on for about 30 years, and that is what is that window during which information from the environment comes into the baby brain and shapes the attentional system to one set of phonetic units as opposed to another, the ones that are going to be critical to distinguishing words in the baby's language. Now, theorists don't debate this curve very much, but what we're all working on is what's the mechanism uh, that accounts for this change in development. What is it that babies are putting to work in the early period that you and I can't seem to put to work uh, later in development? Uh, a critical reason for studying these early periods in development is one that we may discover the principles by which infants are learning and be able to apply those to later learners and increase plasticity in later learners such as ourselves. The other uh, motivation is that early developmental disabilities take hold during this early period, particularly with regard to language. So whether it's autism or dyslexia or fragile X or specific language impairment, it's the early period in which the ability to make those first steps, the gateways to language, have to be taken. So finding out what typical babies are doing may help us a great deal in diagnosing very, very early when the brain is still highly plastic what the, uh, the children who are at risk, and that would allow us to um, create interventions that are uh, novel. So let's start then by looking at what we know about this phonetic period. Uh, how is it that babies discover the consonants and vowels that are used to differentiate words, and when do they do that? An early study in the 70s, two of them, demonstrated something quite interesting about speech perception, and that is that if you create an acoustic continuum from a syllable like ba, to a syllable like pa, and equal steps differentiate the sounds in between, uh, adults were shown in the 50s to have exquisite sensitivity to change right here. Peter Imus in 1971 demonstrated that babies also have this incredible skill at detecting change right at the boundary that divides phonetic categories, and showed not only for the language they were being bathed in, the language they were listening to, but all languages, the sounds of all languages. In 1975, at Central Institute for the Deaf, we did studies on animals, chinchillas first and then monkeys, and illustrated that this sensitivity here at the boundary is evolutionarily deep. Uh, that skill, that sensitivity is enhanced in animals, other mammals who have auditory systems similar to our own. So that primitive basic cut, that sensitivity is there in both. Now I have to tell you that was an unpopular finding in 1975, uh, especially here. Um, Chomsky was very interested, and all people interested in language, uh, in the unique properties of humans in listening to language, and this property was shown to be not unique, which we've been using for about 15 years to motivate why you would jump into the field of MEG with babies, because it is very, very challenging. So uh, let me start with the uh, issues that are especially interesting in development, and then portray that in the field of language and tell you what we've learned. So as you know, the many uh, uh, interesting uh, studies are being done on critical periods in development, uh, windows of opportunity when the environment has a, a very special impact on the brain. Uh, we're very interested in the kind of learning that takes place during that window, and of course what puts the brakes on learning, plasticity, uh, before and after. And probably also, as you know, language is one of the quintessential cases of, of critical periods. Uh, this is a cartoon-type graph taken from a variety of studies that was published uh, in 1999 uh, by one of the pioneers working on, on critical periods. And as you see from this cartoon-type graph, uh, if you look at your age on the uh, horizontal axis and your um, skill level in an acquiring a second language on the vertical axis, you'll see that the babies are geniuses up to about seven. 
but then there's a systematic decline in the child's ability to uh, acquire a second language. Within this period of time, uh, there are a couple of different um, critical periods. One for phonetic learning that we're going to focus on today, uh, one for word learning, and one for grammar. So our next uh, speaker is uh, Pat Kuhl. She is professor at the Department of Speech and Hearing at the University of Washington. And because one department is not enough, she also holds the appointments at the Department of Psychology, Otolaryngology, Neuroscience, Linguistics, Education, and maybe more to come. <laughs> she is a member of uh, the National Academy of Sciences uh, since 2010, uh, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences since 1998, and many, many more awards and memberships, which, of course, I will not mention here. Sorry. Uh, Pat is uh, internationally recognized for her work on early language and brain development. Um, last year, she gave a very interesting uh, TED talk titled The Linguistic uh, Genius of Babies. And uh, her work has been widely covered by the media. Uh, you, can find her, you can see her work on the Discovery Television, PBS, NBC, CNN, CBS. And I will stop because probably I will have to mention all the TV channels. And today, she will um, talk about using MEC to explore developmental change in speech processing, a focus on sensory motor connections. Pat? Thank you. OK, so I, I want to thank uh, Charles and the McGovern Institute for the invitation. It's very, very exciting to have a conference on cognitive neuroscience that focuses on the contributions of MEG. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about how MEG can uh, further the quest to understand human language. Language is one of the grand challenges in neuroscience, and I think that language may provide us one of the best windows into the operations of the human mind. About a decade ago, we decided that we would set as the goal uh, the use of MEG with babies, and I met Dr. Toshi Amada, an engineer at ATR in uh, Tokyo, and I remember being at a cocktail party and walked across the room and said to Dr. Amada, uh, I would like to do MEG with babies. And his eyes got very wide, and I said, is it possible? And he said, it will be very, very difficult. Now, if you understand Japanese, you know that means impossible. <laughs> uh, but I didn't know that at the time, and so I said, let's go. And so he, he joined us in 2001, and we are now uh, finding that the baby brain is, is discoverable. So what I want to do this morning is to take the first part of my talk to develop the rationale. Why would you tackle the baby brain uh, for early language development? I want to take behavioral data and event-related potential